So in the township's zoning bylaw, the subject property is zoned as urban residential first density zone or UR1. Um, this zone does permit single detached dwellings as a permitted use. Um, and the applicant is also going to be applying to the township of South Broughton for a site specific zone to request uh, relief from the minimum lot area and the minimum road frontage for some of the lots. And I'll address that here uh, on the next slide, please. Great, thank you. Um, so the proposal itself for the kind of subdivision is for 31 residential lots, and then there are five lots. There's a proposed walkway to the park, there were blocks uh, for drainage, and then one potential lot addition to a neighboring parcel of land. There will also be a new local road that will connect to the existing intersection of Battersea Road and Sunbury Road. Uh, now, the minimum lot area in the current UR1 zone is a minimum of. Sorry, could we have people online mute themselves? Thank you. Uh, so the minimum lot area in the zone um, is supposed to be 0.8 of a hectare or two acres. The minimum lot area proposed through this uh, subdivision uh, ranges from 0.6 of a hectare to 3.3 hectares, which is about one and a half acres to just over eight acres in size. Uh, the minimum lot frontage required by the current zoning is 76 meters or 250 feet. Um, and what the applicant is proposing, they range uh, from a frontage of 44.7 meters to 167.2 meters, which is just over 146 feet to 540 feet. So there is a range proposed. Next slide, please. So in terms of the project timeline, uh, the application package was submitted in April of 2020 and was deemed complete by staff on May 28th of 2020. Um, the, oh, there was a public open house held in July of 2020, but it was held virtually. We all know what happened in 2020. Um, and then there was uh, there was a public meeting. I'm sorry, do we need do we need to pause? Is there a problem with the online? Okay. Right. Um, the statutory public meeting for the file was held on November 10th uh, of last year, and then just last month on April 4th, uh, South Frontenac Council. Um, passed a motion to endorse draft approval of the plan of subdivision. So where we are today is the red dot. Uh, we are here uh, presenting the county staff recommendation to the committee with respect to draft approval. And your decision on our recommendation will be presented to county council at their next meeting on May 17th. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is just a list of the main technical studies that were submitted and reviewed uh, with respect to the proposed application. Um, several of the reports had uh, multiple iterations and addendums. Um, so there's been back and forth and conversation with the applicant and their team uh, with the reviewers over the course of the last, uh, the last three years. So the technical review was done by uh, county and township staff and their respective peer reviewers, along with staff at Carroll Point Conservation. Um, at this point, all the technical reviewers are satisfied that the work to date uh, is sufficient to recommend draft approval, subject to the conditions that were outlined in the report. Next slide, please. We did receive a number of uh, public comments, both at the open house and the public meeting, as well as in writing uh, before and after uh, those events. I've just listed here um, sort of the themes, the, the actual comments themselves, along with the detailed responses are listed in attachment five of the report. Um, but the concerns raised um, included uh, farming and agriculture on adjacent lands, uh, questions about the sizes of the proposed lots and the types of homes, the wells and septic systems, uh, traffic and uh, particularly pedestrian safety, uh, the, the loss of green space, wetlands and the natural environment, uh, question about the unopened road miles and several questions about stormwater management. Uh, so those questions have uh, been addressed in the staff report. There were some detailed questions with respect to the hydrogeological study. Um, those details did not make it into the report. Um, so, uh, Mr. Pike, we're going to we're going to go over that at the end when we get to the questions section. Um, I will read out what those detailed questions were, and Mr. Pike will uh, assist with responding to those. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. 
So we are here today uh, recommending draft approval uh, of the plan of subdivision uh, subject to the conditions that are outlined in the report. So, so this is not uh, the final approval. So what will happen is the applicant, um, if, if it is approved by County Council on May 17th, they will have a period of three years in which they have to fulfill the list of conditions in order to apply for final approval. And they have to do all of that before they get to the building permits for the houses and whatnot. Um, and there are 43 conditions uh, listed attached to the report. And some of these are standard conditions, um, while others are specific to the development uh, itself and, and some of the concerns that have been raised. So I'm just going to highlight here um, some of those. Uh, there are conditions specific to access. So the location and naming of the road, location and provision of cash and for the sidewalk and providing a public walkway. There are uh, draft conditions with respect to utilities and on-site works. So these could include easements for utilities and drainage, uh, the requirement for a landscape plan, um, as well as for fencing. So there were some questions from the public with respect to um, what happens to the rear lot lines of some of the lots uh, where they're adjacent to the unknown road allowance or a neighboring field. So there is going to be a requirement for the rear of those, those lots to be fenced so that there is no encroachment uh, onto the adjacent uh, properties. Um, the applicant, uh, because it, the property is located directly adjacent to a large township park, um, in lieu of providing park space themselves in the subdivision, they will be providing cash and new uh, uh, for parkland dedication to the township. To, to the township. Uh, there is additional work that is to be done with respect to on-site sewage disposal and water systems, and this includes further study about the ability for the proposed homes to accommodate additional residential units. Uh, there are provisions with respect to the natural environment, including providing a tree preservation plan, and there is more detailed work to be done with respect to stormwater management, including a lot grading and drainage plan and the sediment and erosion control. Next up, please. So staff recommends that the application is consistent with the provincial policy statement, the county official plan, and the township official plan. Uh, staff are satisfied that the concerns raised to date have been adequately addressed for the purpose of draft plan approval. And so we are recommending approval of the draft plan of subdivision subject to the conditions outlined in the report. And so if I may, Madam Chair, there were um, those three detailed questions from the member of the public about the hydrogeological report. If I may, I'd, I'd just like to read those and then I'm going to ask Mr. Type 2 to follow. Yes, I think that's a good approach. Of course, my email. Uh, do, 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 thank you. It closed on me. So thank you. So the questions I received uh, from Sonia were um, uh, related to the pumping tests were conducted at give or take 19 and a half meters per minute. Uh, and with comparison to garden hose and whether this was a rigorous uh, testing of the aquifer, uh, the general guidelines we follow in the work plans of subdivision and condominium are the T-series Minister of the Environment Guidelines uh, and the D55 guideline relates to hydrogeology. And in that, it requires that a well be put out at 3.5 meters per minute per person. For 120 minutes. It's, we typically work at about a four bedroom home, which would have five occupants. And typically we're looking then for around 18.75 meters per minute. Uh, and the D5 requires 120 minutes of that testing and a six hour pumping test. Uh, generally, we ask the proponent to do six hours at that peak rate. So they do meet the guideline. Uh, they pumped, I'd say, somewhere between six and 7,000 meters. Uh, in that about a six hour period during the pump test, uh, which we would consider to be a, in the D5 series guideline about three times the daily demand for a home at 450 meters per person. But also, if you look at Environment Canada's numbers, um, 250 would be about what they look at for municipal systems. So they're pumping somewhere between three and six times the daily demand uh, for a house, including a well. So this bubble bubble will be what it affect, and they do that all at once. And if they cover task where if you think of a typical household, there's a, a morning bubble as people get up and uh, go through their routine, and then at the end of the day and in the evening, there's another routine. So it's typically split up. Uh, the second concern was of the six wells at the site, one was abandoned for lack of water. Uh, that is true if you look at the 
water quantity across the site. Some areas have more water than others. Uh, and that was something that was addressed in the second iteration of the, the work following peer review. They came back with a cable tool drill uh, and they drilled in a well uh, using cable tool. And they found that that method provided a lot more water on the launch adjacent to a well that um, was kind of was partially marginal. So one of the recommendations that this also provided was that all wells going forward should be drilled using the cable tool method to enhance the ability of the well to, to provide a sustainable and suitable yield. Uh, third comment was similar to the second one that uh, the wells took some wells took over a thousand minutes uh, to recover from 95% of their kind of static conditions. And when you look at that again, that related to the they were on the word of marginal, maybe portions of the property, and where they're recommending on a cable tool method. But all the those wells were approved out at somewhere between three and six times what we would assume is the average daily demand for that house. So, in our opinion, it's still at a suitable yield, where it's fairly used to in our neck of those people having, especially as a strong neck, a plentiful water. Uh, so, in, in our opinion, they have worked their way through the issues of water quantity. They have made recommendations on for future wells how that would be addressed and the mechanisms that would be the conditions uh, such that future wells would as well be assessed to confirm that they have suitable yield. And I think those were the comments about their bank and Sami. Oh, that I think that was everything that was in the and and so I mean at this point, between myself, um, the applicants team, and their staff, um, we're happy to answer any questions that the committee Any follow up questions from the committee? Greg, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you for your report. The uh, when you're talking about the amount of uh, liters per person per day, uh, could you repeat that again? Was that around six hundred? So in the T5 series guidelines, but for the Ministry of Environment Guidelines Act, then they used to review kinds of subdivisions. So that's back in the early 90s, early to mid 90s. They used to go 450 meters per day per person. And if you have four bedrooms, you would assume five occupants. So one bedroom, two people, and then the other three bedrooms with one person in them. And that's how we would aggregate. What is that? 20, 2250 meters per day? Uh, I would assume. And then if you look at more recent Environment Canada data where they track out of municipal drinking water systems, they are in around 250 meters per day per person. So, you know, between 30 years ago and more recent data, there does seem to be a downward trend in usage of water per person. Uh, just one other question. The the amount of water that is coming into the household and how much of the water is going out into the septic system and the septic system capable of to recover or filter that water properly through the septic system. So yes, they're they're designed that way. That's a we have a township responsibility here. And so the uh, here um, address septic. So, oddly, the way we calculate probably a higher demand of water usage because we want to be conservative and that people have enough water. And then when they look at flows, they look at different, a bit different numbers and how they calculate the peak septic usage would be to go through the septic funds. Judy? Uh, thank you for the report, Matt. I was wondering about water quality because when I was reading through the documents, there seemed to be a significant water quality in an issue. And tie into that, uh, just this morning, I was by and from the road, I could see a lot of water lying in the fields. And I noted in the report that the potential of grade septic system was part and parcel of what the plan was. However, water runs downhill, and there seemed to be an awful lot of water there before anything else started with um, 
buildings and blocking off any of the land and that was future and everything else. And on that note, how high is the case is recommended to be to protect the well head? Because if there's that much flooding that can come on through with heavy rains and we're expecting heavy rains to be the climate change pattern at this point in time. Seems like a lot of people could have to increase the cold spring blues when you get a runoff hitting into the well. So I wanted to make sure that people um, the churches, especially in the lower area, and that along the uh, I believe it's Clark Randy Road, is it? Randy Road. Randy Road. And that seems very low on that. And uh, people on the hill, well, I anticipate you have an advantage, even if they don't have that much soil and can truck that in, et cetera. But the people on that lower level will certainly have some impact. And that water drainage that I was looking at today certainly didn't respect the road and it drained two thirds in the hydrology report towards the farm area that is laden with water today. So it does impact agricultural land in a significant fashion. I want to know that the water is coming from Pontiac Island. We deal a lot with water. Uh, understood. And I think there's a couple of components to your questions so about is going to be help. And some of them might want to an answer for related to stormwater and management and the movement of the surface water. But with respect to the wells, the uh, Ontario Regulation 903 uh, guides how wells are installed. The wells now are required to have an appropriate stand up and they're not for them. And the well casing is required to be for the damage as well uh, to prevent that surface water interaction around the well. As it, on top of that, it has to be sealed at the top. So if you see a new well, it'll have that kind of uh, uh, aluminum color type seal on the top, and it's got a gasket and it's all sealed. So even if the well was completely flooded with water, it's supposed to be watertight to prevent that. And certainly, we know and see a lot of people around you still have well pits and other shallow wells that are susceptible to that surface water uh, infiltration, but that is not permissible today. Uh, second, when we look at water quality, we looked at bacteria. Bacteria is an indicator of influence from surface water. And certainly there was uh, some additional questions around that, say more deep corner of the property where there is a bit of a wetland, and they were able to prove out that the wells uh, met the bacteriological standards in the G5 series guideline, including zero through four. On top of that, there is a recommendation in, in the consultant reports that everybody has appropriate water filtration and the UV system. And those are meant as a precautionary measure. And in the D5 series guideline, you have to provoke for health parameters that uh, all water. So I believe like source protection and a lot of other areas of the water, there's multiple layers to how we look at protecting the long term, the long term user of the water beyond its initial testing. Um, and then we maybe the, the rest of your questions related to stormwater management and how that's conveyed, and that's sort of part of my dream. Thank you, Madam Chair. Perhaps um, Mr. Yeltsin or his team would be able to discuss that. One more, one more add-on regarding the water quality. That I was mentioning uh, the water currently is going to the other side of the road. I'm just wondering about the wells for the homes that are already established that are not part of this development. This has been uh, consideration as to that this additional drainage. And that impact in their well quality or anything of that nature, and that could have significant. So, perhaps I can start with that response. Uh, part of it is the nearby wells were considered as part of the study. I believe some of them were uh, monitored to look for mutual well interference. Uh, as to the impact of the off sites on water management, that's all you have. I don't know that's important. I'm going to put on the aging, including the project as well as the 
and engineer them a bit. And I start wondering actually and, and creating and get the conformity to well issue. There's also a recommendation for steel case um uh, in limestone air and this will actually go sandstone. So there's some additional protection that they're typically would be on on most subjects and that's covered in the uh, traffic conditions. Um, so moving on to stormwater. So um this the, the site um, like you said is a low lying area kind of in the northeast corner of the site along Range Clark Road. Um although there's no kind of lots for those front um Range Clark Road on this plant. So the, the new the, the new road kind of develops the center, which is much higher, which is much higher than Range Clark Road. Um, and um, the, the concept we actually came up with actually has the houses up, up tight to that road. Um, there will be a great plan on this on the entire site um, um, to drain basically uh, any drainage to the side yard lot um, There's a couple also um, drainage um, blocks on the site. So, on the south end, there's no um, existing water course there. Um, the south, it's, um, it's going to be realigned with the property lines, and there's going to be some easements there and engineering to design that to make sure it does not overtop. Um, along the northwest, the north actually property line of the site is also a drainage block. Um, it's designed to store the water coming off the houses and roads. So any water leaving the site will be asked for less than redevelopment. So whatever's leaving the site now, there won't be any more on the site. That's through a combination of enhanced swales, um, check dams, and, and another uh, a bunch of other kind of bolted back tools that are using the site. Um, and there will be a, a great plan across the entire site to make sure nothing's directed um, to any of the proposed well or any to help the existing features that are there. Okay, Ron, did you have something to add? Well, I was going to answer the question for him, but I have to do a couple of other comments. Uh, I was at the public meeting and I thought that the questions that were asked and the answers that were given, not that. Usually the public always is happy with the answers, but they were answered very well. I thought they were all addressed, and I, I thought they did a great job on that. Uh, Subprime Act also requires now, even on individual lots, all drainage plans. So we don't affect anybody now like it used to be. Every lot that that's created has to have a drainage plan. So that's obviously taken care of. Um, I have another comment, but I'll leave that one for later. It's not technically on this. I don't want to want to do the water on this. So. Okay. Do you think else? Um, I was also on that uh, virtual meeting that public comments there. And there was a technical issue in that. I'm glad that the person that had a lot of information they needed to get finally got recognized and, and able to participate. But one thing that's still struck me when it's going through is this started basically not with this company per se, but in 2013, there was the first iteration. And since 2013, there seemed to have been a significant pre loss that may have impacted the original hydrologic studies. Can you speak to the difference between 2013 and what this is now? Yeah, you, Madam Chair, uh, that predates my time with the project, so I may turn over to Mr. Uh, Wilson he's got some uh, history. Yeah, so in 2013, the property was actually owned by another owner. Uh, so I wasn't involved in, in this project at that time either. Um, these plants didn't contain these lands until kind of 2018 or, or so. There are those plus or minus here. So we weren't involved in kind of any of that work beforehand. But um, from, from a from a pre clearing point of view, I'm not, I'm not aware of any orders or anything against that the previous um, owner. And I, I think to this point, he, he probably would have. We probably could clear could clear fields so um, similar to the, the adjacent farms as well. Now 
the stormwater has been assessed on the existing conditions. Um, so anything clearing that was done, like I did, I, I haven't, I've been out there, I can't really tell what the between 2013 and, and now to the extent from what I've seen of any cutting, it really would not impact the stormwater that I was talking about. Okay, Ryan. Uh, I would like to say the township of South Pontiac also does not have a tree cutting bylaw. However, after the application is in, then you can have some controls. Before that, anybody is still allowed to third or copper. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying that's the rules. And the studies that we're talking about today were done after that tree cutting. So this is the stuff that that is in right at the moment and how it will affect. And it was not fancy. Okay, Jim. Is Adirondack Way Conservation still involved? Because when I'm looking through the uh, approvals and that they still are being named, and I know that that's been sort of changed for the future development, but because they were initially involved, that's why they're still continuing. So through you, Madam uh, Chair, we so so yeah, they were involved, um, and they did review all these bills with them, and that's what has been an heritage perspective. As since Bill 23 came into effect from the province. Uh, they can't comment any further on heritage matters, um, but they are still responsible for commenting on natural hazards, including flooding, uh, flooding and erosion. Um, so they will be uh, reviewing the detailed uh, drainage plan and the original seven plans when they are submitted uh, for the final approval application. They will be involved for, for that component as well. I'm sorry about that. Um, first, I think the project is really good, and I think the area needs these kind of projects. So, thank you for all the team that worked on this and the developer for putting the, the investment in something like this. Um, I have a few questions. First, was there a traffic impact done on the area to see if the increase in units will affect the roads, adjacent roads, and how would that be? Uh, in fact, the second thing I read in the comments that there are this plan for planning for maybe possible future increase of units. If that is a possibility between now and the commencement of the construction, will that be a range or be change all this study that has been done, or that will happen at a later stage? I'll start with the last. Great. Troy, do you want to go ahead and switch to traffic? Sure. Through the chair, um, there was a traffic uh, assessment submitted by GHD in support of the plan of subdivision back in uh, December 1st, 2021. Uh, that study looked at a uh, few elements in terms of existing uh, traffic conditions that can proximate the subdivision and factored in. The impact uh, of the building conditions have reviewed all the performance of the intersections at uh, where Street A intersects Patterson Road. Uh, the levels of service for all approaches at that intersection will continue to operate at the level of service A, so there's not intended to be any negative impacts on the running roadway. Uh, as part of that review, uh, GHD also looked at whether or not there would be a warrant for a pedestrian um, uh, activated uh, EXO or essentially. That's an activated signal on Spatter C, and uh, the review was done against the Ontario Drop Command in 2015, and the warrants were not met. And some conditions on that. Um, they also looked, of course, at uh, the active transportation aspects, which uh, resulted in pedestrian blocks connecting to the neighboring municipal park. So, in short, no negative uh, traffic implications coming through that review. Hey, if you know, Andrew, I'm just going to address then um, Mr. Hodge's second question, if I could, which I think is with respect to the additional growth of energy units. Yeah. Um, so, so today, um, if we're someone to come in with a proposal for a kind of subdivision of that condominium, we would be asking them from the beginning to include that kind of analysis in their work on um, the research for the wells in the septic. Um, it's only been within the last time additional residential units have 
have increased in popularity. Um, so of course it wasn't an issue at the time when this application was, was first submitted. So we have included a condition that's going to require the applicant before they um, complete their zoning process with the township to redo their well, redo some work for their hydrogeological for the well, um, and, and sort of any sort of additional work needed for the training analysis for the septic to look at the possibility of these properties supporting additional residential units. I don't know what that answer would be. Yeah, it might be that that no, there can't be any. Um, it might be that maybe there could be one additional residential unit provided the gross floor area doesn't go over X number of square meters. Um, but so that's that's the work they're going to have to do. And then if there are parameters that are going to restrict or allow additional residential units, those details would be included by the township in the property. Okay, thank you. Okay. Just going back to traffic that in one of the pieces that mentioned that the founder of the second from this subdivision, but then it was discounted. Through the chair, I don't have the background of that, uh, those discussions. Um, certainly, uh, again, based on that evaluation, KHT has been in the single entrance point on the subdivision, it does meet certified certified standards are required. Uh, I don't have background in this difference about second entrance. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So um, the application came in with the, the entrance in the in the location you see it today uh, across across from somewhere. Uh, through um, through the application and in 2021, uh, so so from the county came back to us and asked us to look at the, an entrance kind of across from the fire hall community center. So. Uh, there were previously, I'm not sure the year, but there were two lots separated from this property previously. One of those lots um, beside it was um, an allowance for future motorways. That allowance was actually transferred in that lot sale. Um, but there's an option for, there was an option for say for them to, to take that back if they had the lot there. We actually did an evaluation on it, had a look at it, and it doesn't really um the road's very vertically challenged there. It's it's very it's very deep, there's not good study lines. So we actually had a look at it, DHP had a look at it, and it just it wasn't a, it wasn't a safe crossing location with the uh, existing condition or facts. So so that that's where that history goes, and that's why we went away from the second entrance. Um, um, instead of that second entrance, though, um, there is there is a sidewalk proposed on the east side of Battersby Road from from where it's term existing terminus all the way up to the the firewall, with which the developers unit will be captured. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, just, just a point of clarification from Mr. Nielsen. You indicated the amount of water leaving the site after development would be the same. Are you talking about the rate of flow, which is kind of the normal way of doing it, or are you talking about rate and volume? Rate of flow. Okay. Anything else? I'm sorry, we're not asking questions of the public at this point, but you can talk to people as soon as we adjourn. Okay, if there isn't anything else, I have a motion. Motion is moved by Neona and seconded by Phil, whereas an application was filed with the County of Frontenac for a draft plan of subdivision located as part of lots 25 and 26 conception to geographic township of Lower in the town of South Frontenac in the county of Frontenac, municipally known as 3863 Battersea Road N, whereas the Planning and Economic Development Advisory Committee and the Council of the County of Frontenac considered all written and oral submissions received on this application, the effect of which helped the Council of the County of Frontenac make an informed decision, and whereas the application is consistent 
with the provincial policy statement 2020, conforms to the Frontenac County official plan, conforms to the Township South Frontenac official plan, and has re been reviewed in accordance with the criteria of Section 5124 of the Planning Act. Therefore, be it resolved that the Planning and Economic Development Advisory Committee received the Planning and Economic Development Advisory Committee application for draft plan of subdivision, 3862 Battersea Road, Sunbury, Township of South Frontenac, file number 10 t 2020 001 report, and further that the Council of the County of Frontenac approve file number 10 t 2020 001 for draft plan of subdivision subject to the draft approval conditions included with this report as attachment three. Any further discussions on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Motion's carried. The next steps and going to just 43 days that you have to fix your own. There's no communications to any other business to run. I just have a comment. We know Mr. Callum won't like this. I don't, as, as everybody knows, I'm not thrilled about the new official plan. I, I don't want to support it. People always complain about strict development. Well, under the three severance rule, we would have took six acres out of 100. Under the new official plan, you're going to take 100 acres out of agriculture by creating the subdivision. So I have I have concerns about the official plan. I know that we don't agree, but I I don't think by changing it to the extent you're changing it that it makes more sense to me. The only thing that I do agree with, I know this plan has changed a couple of times, but it's been 16 years before they can put a shovel in the ground. That is crazy, also. That's ridiculous. I know there was some delays. In, in no money and things like that. But you can see why people get frustrated in this province, according to the bigger ups in Toronto, that it takes 16 years, which is insane. And the expense. Well, you have to be, you have to have a lot of money in order to make money. And that's what that's what's going to stifle development is the way I see it in a new official plan also. Right. Okay, so no other business to come before the committee. Our next meeting is July the 5th at 10 a.m. and it's back here in the council chambers. So, motion for adjournment, moved by Phil, seconded by Ron, that we adjourn until July the 5th, 2023. All those in favor? There we go. Thank you all. Oh, I will be